Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's so nice to see you. I thought you'd be all worn out from the campaign, but I'm great to see you here. The campaign continues. Campaigning for liberty will last a long time. But somebody that campaigns with me and has for a long time is my wife, Carol, sitting over here. <laughs> But it is a delight to see an enthusiastic crowd. I'm delighted you're here tonight and this week and uh, being involved in Campaign for the Liberty. Because um, in many ways, uh, that's what all of us are doing. And in many ways, I've done it for a few years. And um, since we started this organization four or five years ago, four years ago, I guess, I got to name it. And I thought, well, why don't we call it something that I've been doing? Campaign for Liberty. That's what we'll call it. That is it. So that type of campaign goes on for a long time until we win. And since the world is imperfect, uh, we'll never have perfect liberty. But if we don't campaign for liberty, the other side is going to keep campaigning for statism and big government, and they are our enemy, and we must stop them. Probably the uh, best success we've had with the Campaign for Liberty has been the grassroots effort the, the uh, Campaign for Liberty has done on making sure that we got the bill at least passed the House of Representatives to audit the Federal Reserve System. But not, not only that of getting the uh, legislation passed in the House, and who knows, we might still get it the rest of it done in the Senate, but we, we don't know. But the more important thing is calling attention to the American people the issue of monetary policy. They're never going to put that back in the bottle, let me tell you. People know now the importance of monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. Thank you for all your hard art work and effort on that. Really, liberty is the issue because if you understand liberty, you can apply it to whether it's uh, uh, civil liberties, foreign policy, monetary policy, economic policy, it's all very much the same. But in order to understand how the system works, you have to understand the monetary system because big government can't exist without a Federal Reserve. It just wouldn't happen because Congress would have to pay their bills. And the, with the Federal Reserve, they're able to deceive the people, pretend that they're not being harmful, and delay the payment, and that's what all, this is all about. Now, Bernanke, this week, as usual, and as all the Federal Reserve chairmen that I have met, I always say when they get into trouble and they can't seem to be getting out of it, they say, well, Congress has to do more. Of course, they, they shouldn't do more. They should do a lot less is what they need to do. <laughs> But, but Cong Congress, uh, it isn't the Fed against the Congress, the Congress against the Fed. The Congress created the Fed. And the Congress, you know what? They could get rid of the Fed if they want to and should. <laughs> but if there are special interest groups, as there certainly are in this country, that uh, uh, support the warmongering going on in the military industrial complex. And if they had to tax the American people to pay all the bills for all the wars, just think in the last 10 years, the national debt went up over $4 trillion just for the wars that we have been fighting in the Middle East. And just look at the disaster in the Middle East today. 11 country embassies being demonstrated against with violence against Americans because for some reason they don't like us dropping drone missiles on their countries. But the, the, uh, the, the, uh, this expenditure couldn't happen. 
and wars couldn't be fought if we had honest money because the people would have to be taxed and they would rebel and say it's a bad investment. But it is so deceitful and they can delay the inevitable for a long time, but that long time is coming to an end and that's why our work is so important right now because we have to keep plugging ahead. <clears throat> The same is true about domestic uh, welfare spending. If you paid all the bills, the people would rebel and, and uh, everybody would know how much it's costing. But if you can run up the deficits and uh, there is an absolute agreement that the Fed is going to monetize it. They're going to buy that debt. If not, what happens? Interest rates go up. Well, they could borrow for a while, but there's not enough bar uh, lenders out there, so interest rates would be high, higher, and this would be hard for, for the economy. But then all the pressure would be on the people and the Congress to cut the spending and let the people spend the money, not the government. <laughs> if you look at our history up until 1913, uh, it was far from perfect. But the size of government uh, didn't have steady growth. And uh, it was the inevitably bad year of 1913 that changed you know, our history so dramatically. Bringing in the Federal Reserve, changing the foreign policy that said that we're going to make the world safe for democracy. We'll have to fight one more war to, uh, the war to end all wars. And you know how well that has worked out. Create a, a, you know, an income tax and just think of the last past hundred years. But as I have tried to say so many times and certainly tried to point it out in, in Tampa, is it's all coming to an end and we should be grateful that it's coming to an end. So the question isn't so much, will the Keynesian and, and socialism, welfareism, and interventionism end, it's how it's going to end, and how many people are going to be prepared, how many of us will be out there, how many will, how many will then argue the case for sound money, and personal liberty, and economic liberty, and a sensible foreign policy. That is what we have to have out there. Now it'd be nice, as I suggested in the campaign, there is no reason why we can't have a transition. We can move from one to another. We could turn down the uh, spigots of spending and bring our troops home and cut back on spending and work our way out of this. The odds aren't very good that's gonna happen. Just this week, you know, the, uh, the, there was efforts, a continuing resolution for uh, six, uh, six more months. And the one thing for sure, the party that's in charge of the House of Representatives made sure that the military budget went up 26% on the continuing resolution. See, this is, uh, th th this is the reason why I am, I'm convinced that we are going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Wh when are we going to see that the Fed all of a sudden is going to be a good manager? I mean, we saw what the Fed does this week. I mean, they've been trying for five years to bail out a system that uh, collapsed because they spent too much, borrowed too much, printed too much. So what did they announce this week? Well, what we need to do is we really need to print money, and we've tried QE1 and QE2, now we're gonna have perpetual QE. And now we're gonna give 40 billion of new dollars every month, which is uh, nearly a half a trillion dollars a year, and if necessary, they'll increase it. They've guaranteed low interest rates for another three years, and then they wonder why people uh, don't get their confidence restored and they don't know, uh, you know, people get confused on what to do. Well, there's one reason why they get confused. Uh, and that is the most important thing for individuals to make decisions on business-wise and investments is, is the issue of interest rates. Because in a market economy, if the people save money, they, dra you know, they drive the interest rates down. And the businessman said, oh, interest rates used to be 4%, they're now 2 this is the time I invest and rebuild. Uh, so uh, what happens if nobody saves any money and interest rates are zero? and then you get really malinvestment. The money is printed, passed out to the banks for free, and then they can put it back in, into reserves and get interest paid from the Federal Reserve, or they themselves, or the banks, or the uh, Federal Reserve, buys debt. And uh, there's no incentive 
to go out and invest in a risky economy because the more the Congress interferes by passing more laws and, and uh, not knowing what the tax code would be, passing socialized medical programs and on and on, people don't have their confidence restored. So th this, is, uh, this is the reason that we are going to go on like this. We do not know when it'll end. It could end soon, it could end later, a year, two or three, who knows? But I I'm, I'm, I'm believe we're getting awfully close to this. Then, this is where our efforts has to pay off because the Campaign for Liberty is actually trying to get more people to not only understand it, but don't at least not be hostile to freedom because free, our answers can be found in freedom. Because in so many other countries, when they have faced these crises, uh, they end up with dictators. And we have more dictatorial and authoritarian governments uh, than ever before. And uh, now, now, not only do they tell you what you smoke and drink and eat, but you know, they're telling you how big your Coca-Cola can be, how big a glass of Coca-Cola you can have. And, and, uh, and you know, it's pretty absurd when uh, you can't drink raw milk and you can't make rope out of hemp uh, and you can't, if you uh, have a serious medical condition, if you have a serious medical condition that can be helped with marijuana, you get put in prison with your wheelchair and all. There's something seriously wrong. I would say they don't understand what liberty is all about. But obviously you do, and that's good, and that's the good news. And there are a lot more of you out there than you ever realized, a lot more than I ever dreamed of. Because I have often uh, made the comments that uh, I did uh, do a little bit of speaking. I used to practice a lot speaking because I would go to college campuses. I used to be able to get 30 or 40 people out in one group on a college campus. <laughs> but now a few more come, and uh, we should... <laughs> Now, in the, old, in the old days, if you went to, if you were running as a conservative Republican, you go to a conservative campus and you get a nice crown out, you get all the pluses. Hey, isn't this great? But if you went to Berkeley and you ended up getting a big crowd, say, oh, what? Even the University of Texas, you say, hey, you know, you're in Austin, you better be careful. But now with the freedom movement, you can go to a conservative campus and get a large crowd out and go to Berkeley and get a bigger crowd out. <laughs> So that makes my point. Freedom brings people together. People who believe in freedom for different reasons, we all should come together. It should uh, you know, eliminate this whole concern about diversity. Whether you want to spend your money, save your money, or whatever, you, or, or, or waste your money. You know, in a free society, you can do it. But if you waste your money, don't go to your neighbor and say, you have to bail me out and you have to pay more taxes. That's what you can't do. But it truly does bring people together. And uh, that's what I think is so magnificent about it. Not only on the money issue, we understand it on the religious issue. Uh, Americans are pretty good, except when they get angry at certain groups and they have to bash them and say, well, they're the cause of the war and all this kind of stuff. But uh, in religion, we, we, tend, we have so many different uh, religious beliefs and we have people, guess what, in a free society, you're even allowed to be an atheist. We don't put you in prison for that. But that, it isn't the point of what you believe, it is the point that you're allowed to believe. And the other important thing is, is when you legalize freedom, whether it's personal habits or economic habits, you don't endorse what the people do. And, and that's a big difference. A lot of people will come up to me and say, Ron, I agree with you, and this drug war is horrible, it's all this bad, but I can't endorse, you know, people doing those things, you know, to their body, and we have to protect them against themselves, you know? Uh, and I was thinking, yeah, politicians and bureaucrats know more about protecting you against yourself than they do themselves. So I would say, that, that doesn't work. And uh, that it, this, this whole notion that we have to depend on the government to tell us what our habits should be. But if we allow people to make these decisions, you know, in economics it's easy, in social 
socially uh, and religious sense, a First Amendment. It, it should, it's, it's, it's a uh, philosophy of tolerance, but tolerance is not endorsement. And uh, if, uh, if, if you get to keep all your own money and you gamble away and lose it, that doesn't mean I endorse gambling. What, like I said though, that if you have a lifestyle that punishes yourself and you suffer from it, you cannot use force to take, be taken care of by other people. You have to suffer the consequences. Not only should you suffer the consequences, you should reap the benefits. What if you're frugal and you save uh, and you invest, you should be able to keep the fruits of your labor. That's why the income tax is morally wrong. You shouldn't have an income tax. But in today's society with the government uh, that we have now and been put, them up with, put, put up with for so long is, instead of uh, being the protector of private property, they destroy the concept of private property. Instead of protecting and enforcing contracts, they, f they interfere with the contracts and put force on it and, uh, and, and manipulate things. So this, uh, th they're wor working perversely, you know, uh, the Constitution, as well as the Coinage Act of 18, uh, 1792, is don't counterfeit. It's a serious business. But what do we have? We have the uh, Federal Reserve as the chief counterfeiter of the world. So, <laughs> then we have the Fed manipulating money and credit. We have people who still would like to take care of themselves. Work hard, save some money, put it in the bank, earn some interest. Yeah, half a percent or one percent. And Bernanke, he was on the air today uh, recognizing this because he's done it to me in the committee when I bring it up. All right, somebody wants to save their money. They, they don't want to take risks in the stock market and they want to learn, earn a little interest and they don't earn, you know, enough. He says, yes, but the health, of the, econ the health of the economy is more important than making sure that everybody's taken care of. Some people will suffer. So if you're elderly or on a fixed income or you want to save and, uh, and you can't earn any interest and the market rate of interest would be five or 6%, that's beside the point because we have to help, out, help the economy. Usually the uh, word economy means banks and big corporations and politicians and governments and foreign intervention. That's what it is. That's why we have to attack this whole system. But the really good news is that uh, a lot of people are hearing this message. You have helped to spread it. The internet spreads it. You have had numerous speakers here. The uh, Congress, you know, I was, I was kidding the other day, but it is true, you know, uh, I used to be voting by myself was sort of a neat little event to at least wave a flag. Look here, you guys. <laughs> but now I have these guys like Justin and Marsh and other people, they're voting with me and I can't be by myself hardly at all. <laughs> And, and there are going to be some new people. Then uh, it won't be fast enough. We have to keep doing it. But setting a standard and setting a record is very, very good because people are watching and they will be encouraged. And this is why no matter if we can get the good people in Congress, they have to be principled and stick to their guns. We have to keep working with the Campaign for Liberty. We have to change people's minds. Ideas do have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences. So these things are powerful, powerful weapons that we have. And we have the side of truth on, uh, the tr side of, we're on the side of truth, which makes a big difference. If freedom is the answer and authoritarianism is something that, that has been around for thousands of years and has always failed, undermining personal liberty. I mean, we do, we have truth on our side and uh, we just have to energize people. We have to get their confidence back. This is what's happened to the American people. They've lost confidence in true freedom. They say, well, yeah, freedom is good. That's a good thing. But you, you have to give up some of it to be safe. You know, how can you have a safety net and how can you be protected against the terrorists if we didn't have TSA, you know? <laughs>
Yeah, I think so. I think that's a little bit confused thinking, and I think more Americans are beginning to understand this. But uh, private property would have saw would solve all that problem at the airport. Uh, the people who are supposed to uh, provide the security are the airlines, not bureaucrats that belong to labor unions and everything else. Uh, But we've given up on the idea of private property and contracts and sound money, but uh, we've, we've been careless on allowing certain small groups of people talk the American people into believing that if you don't support the wars, you don't support the troops, and you're un-American, and you're not patriotic, guess what? The people in, on active military duty have spoken. They have been uh, very vocal, and guess what? They support the cause of liberty, and they supported our campaign and said these wars are unnecessary and not beneficial. And, of course, a very good reason to just bring them home. We could. And I can't understand the uh, inability of us to convince more because, to me, it seems so logical. If you're out of money and the wars aren't any good and they're not constitutional and we've spent $4 trillion we didn't have and we would have more peace and prosperity by having a foreign policy where we defend our country properly and constitutionally with the permission of the people through the Congress instead of allowing the President, the United Nations, and NATO decide it, why shouldn't this be welcomed with open arms and say it's time to bring them home? So the rule of law has been, uh, you know, carelessly uh, t taken care of. We, we don't really follow it. No, nobody, not many at least, really care about the Constitution uh, in the Congress. I mean, they take the oath of office. But the worst part about it isn't that they, they don't follow the Constitution, which is horrible, but they believe they're following it. I mean, they've, they've, they've been rationalized by our educational system that said, well, it's not, it was never meant to be overly rigid. It has to be adaptable. We have to adapt it to modern times. Uh, even today, I was on an interview, and he kept saying, and I kept, uh, we, we were talking about ec economy, and I swear the economy was pretty good without a, without a central bank back in the 19th century. I don't want to talk about that. That's old fashioned. We don't even want to go back to that. But we, we do have to uh, recognize that uh, markets work and foreign policy works and going backwards is, uh, is, is not the problem. What we want to do is pick up the pieces. We had a good system. We knew what we had. It, it's to quit doing the dumb things because it's so easy to figure out that living within our means as individuals, we have to do it. And uh, government should have to do it. The politicians should be held, held responsible. But the big question is, really, the question that always has to be asked, and you have to get the right answer, and that is, what should the role of government be? And uh, government's been around for a long, long time, and uh, government's always overstepped. But if the government would be what the Constitution says it should be, it should be very limited to the protection of liberty. If you want more government, it should be local and not at the federal level. Certainly, it shouldn't be international. It shouldn't be United Nations. But it's been rationalized by the members of Congress and by the people. I certainly heard it. It, was, uh, it really hurt to hear people so often say right after 9-11, well, it looks like we have to sacrifice our freedoms now to be safe. And, um, you know, the truth is, is if you take an oath of office, if you take an oath to be a president, 
You don't swear an oath, I'm going to keep the American people safe from here on out. You know, that is, matter of fact, if you start on that, that means I am going to keep you safe and you'll have no more liberty. <laughs> you know, and that's the only way you can be perfectly safe. Uh, so, uh, no, you, you, want, you want to obey the law and you want to protect life, liberty, and property and not, not, not much else, you know, a judicial system. And, but we had given up on this 100 years ago. But the magnificent story is now that uh, it, it's been much more than I ever expected in these last four or five years. There's been a tremendous surge in the interest of this. I mean, just think a whole new generation of young people right now uh, are joining us. I mean, a lot of us have been fighting this for a long time and we've always been outnumbered. But if we can keep this energy going with the younger generation, and I'm not talking about the college graduate, I'm talking about the college student and the high school student. They know and understand this stuff. I get, I get pretty impressed if I meet a high school student. He says, I've been reading Mises and Hayek and Rothbard. I, I hadn't even heard those names until I got out of college. So uh, now the, 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 the people I meet from the younger generation are way ahead of anybody I ever met when I was in high school and college. But the needs are much greater. There was a lot of wealth left. There was a lot of momentum and we've been consuming it for now several decades. There is no real wealth in this country. What you see as wealth, most of it is debt. The dollar function, but the dollar is debt. So it doesn't have a real value, but the trust in the dollar is still there. So there is always a subjective element on value. There's, a, there's still, uh, I thought around the world, well, the Americans have all the weapons and they have a lot of wealth. We're going to take their dollars and that sort of thing. But it could come to an end. Matter of fact, the last four days since uh, Bernanke announced, uh, you know, this QE, con continuous QE, the dollar has gone down sharply. And with this stuff going on over in the Middle East, as well as, uh, uh, you know, the oil price is going up and all, we could be getting uh, pretty close to this. This stuff in the Middle East really dramatized. I guess you've seen on TV some of the maps now. They will paint each country in red that had some, uh, some revolt or rebellion again and demonstration against America in the last week. And there are 11 countries right now. And they, they want to tell you that it's because somebody, someplace, did a video that nobody has seen and nobody understands, and they say, oh, that's why they hate Americans. Well, guess what? It's all an air of countries that we have been taken over. We prop up the dictators. We're on both sides of all those issues. We prop up dictators like in uh, Egypt, give them billions and billions of dollars and pay them to be friends of Israel. And then all of a sudden the people rebel against that government. And uh, so we, owe, we participate in the overthrow of our puppet uh, leader in, uh, in Egypt. And then somebody else comes in and lo and behold, guess who's in the rebellion? The Al-Qaeda. So, and the Al-Qaeda is in, in, uh, in Libya as well, and they're, they're involved in, uh, in Syria. They weren't in, in uh, Iraq, but they are now. I mean, the whole thing about the foreign policy has, makes no sense whatsoever. We spend all that money and we're less safe. And, uh, and, and that, that can get out of hand. Um, I, I, there's a lot of planning done on, on how to manage and spread our empire, but, and, and they don't sit down and say, well, let's have a world war. Uh, but sometimes some of those plans get out of control. What I fear the most is a false flag, something happening where one of our ships goes down or there's a plane goes down, and of course it had to be the Iranians, you know, for sure, for certain. But who knows, uh, but then the emotions run high. But even today when, you, you know, uh, our amb ambassador was killed, I mean, there's a lot of people ready to go to war over this and uh, never asking the, uh, the serious questions. But uh, I am convinced that if we have a sensible foreign policy, we would have more friends in the world. I think and that is important. But the neocons are quick to criticize and say, well, 
Ron Paul just doesn't understand nor does he care about this great thing called American exceptionalism. That we are the greatest and the best and we can tell people what to do. Well, we could be the greatest and we could be the best and we've had a lot of a, a good traits in the past. But the one thing that we as a people have to come to realize that if we have good traits and we do a good job, have a good economy, a sound money and a sensible foreign policy and mind our own business, guess what? Others might want to copy us. They might want to emulate us. But right now, there's not much effort in that. I am also concerned if there's a false flag and things uh, uh, break out, what's going to happen is we'll go bankrupt at the same time. And if you think the map right now of those 11 countries expressing their anger toward us, I think there's going to be a lot more who have been held in check because we've had weaponry and we've had money. And my complaint has always been that we've only had two options on foreign policy. One, you do what we tell you, we'll give you a lot of money. Or if you don't do it, we're going to give you a lot of bombs. Right now, we're doing both to some of these countries. We're shooting them at one time, and at the same time, we're giving them money. And uh, why don't we offer this other one uh, based on the constitutional liberty? Why don't we offer neither? Just offer them friendship and trade, no money and no bombs. That's what we need. One of the things that the freedom movement has been doing and the Campaign for Liberty is trying to get people to think of liberty as a whole, not in pieces. And liberty was chopped into pieces and still today you have conservatives defending one part of it and liberals another part of it. And, uh, and, and, and then it's also mixed up by even the conservatives who might be pretty good on economics if they get a president that's not so conservative, they have to go along with them because it's a partisan thing. And then you'll have it on the other side, you might have a president supposed to cut back on uh, arresting people for marijuana and also have less war, and he defies it, but then the Democrats say, oh, we can't challenge him at all. What we have to do is challenge people and say, look, when a conservative says the right thing about economics and a liberal or somebody else says something right about civil liberties and uh, you know getting the government out of our personal lives or anybody would say you know a foreign policy that makes sense and we have coalitions in congress now uh, because there are less democrats because we have a current democrat president the coalition is smaller but the numbers of the republicans are growing you know, in this coalition of saying, we don't need this. So this is again, once again, bringing people together and, and, and seeing liberty as a whole. It's one, one piece, and I think that's what we have to work on. A lot of times they'll accuse us of wanting to go back to the dark ages, but the dark ages is uh, authoritarianism. Uh, you know, freedom is a relatively uh, new idea. Uh, the history of man, when you consist, can consider the history of the universe and how many billions of years that, uh, uh, you know, the planets and all existed, man has only been around for a short period of time and knowledgeable man is just in terms of thousands of years when they were, when they were reflecting and writing books. So it's, it's very short. But the history of man making great progress and understanding how important liberty is, is very, very short. You know, in, a, in the term of all history, it's just a couple seconds or a couple minutes. And uh, so we're really just on the cusp of, 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 of understanding, uh, you know, what this is all about and what it can bring about. But there's only one principle that has to be followed <clears throat> because our views and our desires and our preferences are all different, is that is you can't force other people to do your bidding if they're not hurting you. But a lot of people will accept that. It's easier to get to accept, you know, just don't uh, hurt me or don't steal my property. Uh, but then they say, it's okay for the government to do it. 
The government is not allowed to initiate force against anybody either. They can only be in a participant in trying to repel force or settle disputes. But they can't come along and say, well, we're going to use force to make other people do their bidding, but even though the individual shouldn't do it. So it's individuals and government that should never be able to initiate force or violence against another one to bring about social or economic changes. That one rule would save, solve our problems, I'll tell you. Practically all. But we should be, we should be very optimistic. Uh, I know there are some who say, um, you know, we should have done better, you know, in the campaign. Uh, quite frankly, um, I, I think we did pretty good. <laughs> Those who, those who said, say that we should have done significantly better, I don't know whether they quite understand, you know, what we're, we as a group are taking on. I mean, it isn't like we're taking on one small faction of the Republican Party and saying, yeah, we want to nudge you a little bit more conservative or something like that. I mean, we're taking on the establishment that controls both parties. <laughs> So it's, it's the banking system, it's the welfare state, it's the military industrial complex, it's a lot of corporatism and, and subsidies that go out to so, ma <clears throat> so many. So I'll, I say that uh, the task is rather large, so the success I think is, uh, is very significant. But the other way you might look at it if you're looking for a positive sign, I don't know how many <clears throat> candidates there were in the um, first uh, five, four years ago Let's say there were 12, let's say there were 10 or 12 this time, so there were about 20. Uh, there, there weren't very many that came in second. You know, there were a few that dropped by the wayside that didn't make an impact, and they're done and gone, and they have debt in the bank, and they don't even pay their bills. <laughs> But the real excitement is the numbers that are, the numbers of people are joining us, and that's that's where we should be positive. We have we have so many more people now, uh, you know, in in office at all levels of government, and there's, there's, there'll be a lot more added added this uh, uh, fall. Now we can't uh, we, that isn't that isn't the total measurement, but it is a significant measurement. There's some people you know that uh, love liberty and fight for it and write about it and say you know. Uh, this voting stuff doesn't add up to much. But uh, political activism, if it had been ignored by the founders, we would still be in a pretty big mess because they were philosophic and they were idealistic, but they took political action too. So that's why I think political action is quite all right. <clears throat> But I want to encourage you and thank you for all that you have done. Continue to do your work um, and do your job. And then people say, well, what is my job? <laughs> you have to decide what your job is. Um, you just have, uh, the only thing I can urge you to do is understand the, understand the principles, understand the principles of liberty. But you're here, you're a participant, you're involved, and we have uh, uh, people representing us in different levels of government. But everybody has something to do. It can be purely educational. It can be, I, when people come in to the office and ask, uh, a lot of times they want to say, how do I become a congressman? I say, don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if it happens to come along, most of it's luck and, and this sort of thing. But you, uh, there's a lot of uh, you, you know, uncertainties about running for office and there, there is some luck in it. But a lot of times I encourage them to, uh, you know, if they're very interested, I would just love to see more in the media, more writers, more in the newspapers and the TV. <laughs> but even, even that's getting easier because right now, if you look at the number of people who look at CNN for their news, you get, most people are now getting more news off their internet and off their computers than they are out of CNN. So we're already there in many ways. So 
that, uh, and everybody has different talents. Some people don't even want to do public speaking. Some people enjoy it. Some people want to run for office. Some people, some people actually have a knack, even under these circumstances, they can make money in this economy. Well, let them go make the money and let them help out the other groups, you know? And we have a lot of supporters that way, and that's their prime goal is they do well and understand it, and they make money, and they donate to these, uh, these organizations. So that, that is pretty important. But, but everybody, once you, once you discover what's going on and you basically understand this philosophy, actually it's a pretty uncomfortable position to put you in because I hope you're miserable the rest of your life unless you're trying to do something about it. <laughs> And I, I do believe the people who are informed, that they're a moral person, and they say, you know, we know this is a bad situation, and if you're directed by wanting to uh, uh, know the truth and, and spread the truth, and it's a moral principle, you do have a greater obligation. And you know what? You're in a group that's only going to be probably the group that's about 10% of the population because you know the issues, you understand them, you study and you read. But most people, even those who vote, uh, they don't think about it until the day before the election sometime. Uh, all these polling on who's going to win in November, I, I think it's all talk because they'll probably, a bunch of people aren't, aren't even going to pay much attention. And who knows, uh, there might be uh, uh, something else to do that day. They might rain, they might not even show up, you know, for that matter. But uh, th it is... Um, um, your role is very important, and that's why I work very hard and encourage every, all the uh, team on Campaign for Liberty to be involved. So I'm glad you're here and want to assume, you know, some responsibility. And of course, uh, you know, if you don't have any fun doing it, it can be a real dull job. <laughs> so ha have some fun doing it. and. One thing that is fun, though, is being with like-minded people. Isn't that pretty neat? <laughs> and to tell you, to tell you the truth, I like to be with people that are like-minded that might have a completely different attitude about what their social values are and what they want to do with their money and how they want to do, because I can just sort of smile and say, well, you know, I wouldn't do that. I, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. <laughs> but I think it's still neat that we can bring these people together and say, it's freedom, it's liberty. That's what we're fighting for. Thank you very much for all your efforts. Thank you.